Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, our risen and victorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Peace, tranquility, calm, quiet, silence, order, harmony, accord. These are some of the words you'll find if you look up synonyms for peace. Tranquility and calm, quiet, silence, order, harmony, and accord. Now, how many of you out there find yourself wishing for a little bit of this pretty often? Some tranquility, some calm, some quiet. Perhaps you have young children who need constant attention and you just can't get a moment to yourself. Maybe work is driving you like mad and you're burning the candle at both ends. Can't I just get a break for a moment, a day? Or maybe an important relationship of yours is marred with conflict and strife and you just pray for the peace of reconciliation. There are many other examples of times in our lives when we crave for peace, for some tranquility, some calm. But sometimes we don't find it. Some quiet time, you might want that. Not because you don't love your kids, but you just need a break. Some tranquility for a day or two at work, just to recuperate and recharge your batteries some harmony in a conflicted relationship. Well, in our gospel reading today, we're hearing about peace. Our risen Lord appears to his disciples, and the first thing he says to them is, peace be with you. And this is, if you're paying attention, although sometimes we take it for granted because it's just a normal part of our exchange as Christians, we say peace be with you, or the peace of the Lord be with you a lot in the life of the church. So the question is, is it this kind of peace? Is it the same sort of peace that you're asking for when you want a little reprieve from work? Is it a peace from suffering, from busyness, and from stress? Or is it something more that Jesus is bringing to his disciples in our gospel reading today? Well, let's dig into the text and find out. The setting for our gospel reading is... Jesus is dead, or so his disciples think, right? The, the events of Holy Week have occurred, and they don't yet know that the resurrection is a reality. They think Jesus is dead and gone for good, and everything is ruined. He died an accused criminal, and they're afraid that they're going to be wrapped up in the scandal of his accusation and death. And so we find the disciples huddled together inside a locked room. And the text tells us specifically for fear of the Jews. They were afraid that they were going to do the same thing to them that they had done to Jesus. Imagine their anxiety. Right? We talk about anxiety being a problem. Imagine, put yourself in that situation. Somebody you've been seen with publicly for the last three years. And that you put all your hopes and faith in, now stands accused and dies the most heinous death a criminal deserves, and you're left behind. You can imagine the fear and the anxiety and the worry that is plaguing their minds. In fact, you could even say that we understand it, that if we were in a similar situation, we'd probably be doing the same thing. Our As We Gather statement highlighted that a little bit, right? Sometimes it's easy when we read the events of Scripture to be like, well, if I had seen and heard all the things they had, I wouldn't be hiding scared in a room. And the sad reality of the Scriptures is, because of our total depravity of sin, that's exactly where you and I would be. Afraid, thinking everything is over. Well, in the midst of that space, in the midst of their anxiety and their worry and their fear, Jesus appears. Now, just before we you know, get to the part of the sermon that you're probably anticipating, put yourselves in their shoes for a moment. You're already frightened and afraid. You've locked all the doors because you don't want anybody to come in, and you think Jesus is dead, 
and then pop, he just shows up. What do you think their first reaction is going to be to Jesus just showing up out of nowhere? I mean, what, what would your reaction be if somebody you clearly saw die and you know is dead just shows up in your living room while you're eating your dinner? Probably not like, oh, great, wonderful, what I've always been hoping for, right? It's probably like, what is going on? Who are you, right? They probably think he's what? A ghost. But Jesus says to them, peace be with you. Now, the cool thing here is the word for peace in Greek, irene, is used 48 times in the New Testament. And you probably read it a bunch of times and didn't really associate it with this particular text. This is the word used almost every greeting in the New Testament letters. When Paul says, grace and peace be with you from God our Father. That same peace is being given here, but that same peace is really being given here for the very first time. Because as we find out, this isn't going to be a mere reprieve from the stresses of earthly life, but something much more is being given in Jesus' words here, peace be with you. Is Jesus saying to his disciples, hush? Is he saying, calm down? Is he saying, reconcile with one another? Be in harmony with one another? No, it's becoming quite clear that Jesus is talking about something far greater and deeper in his blessing of peace. Notice in the text what Jesus does after he says, peace be with you. What is the first thing that he does? He says, it says that he shows them his hands and his side. Now, why would he do that? He's doing that to show them that he is who he appears to be. And not only that, but something deeper. That what they had witnessed in the past few days and weeks was not imagined. It wasn't a dream. He really did die on the cross. And that's intricately related to the peace he's bringing them is the reality of his victory over those very things. Peace be with you. He shows them his hands and his sides, not a ghost or an imposter. And the, the text is quite clear. The very first word in the next sentence is, then, after he proves that he's, he's in fact the same Jesus they know, then the disciples were glad they saw the Lord. So the text is quite clear. They weren't so happy to see Jesus until they figured out it was really him. And could Jesus have demanded that they just know and believe? Sure. But in his grace and mercy, he proves to them that he is who he says he is. Look at my hands and my side. And perhaps I think the key phrase in understanding that this is not some simple peace that's being offered here is the next one. And you may have questions about this, but bear with me. Jesus says, after he shows them his hands and his feet, he says the same phrase again, peace be with you. Why does he say it a second time? Because in the sentence prior to this, it says, then the disciples were glad they saw the Lord. They seem to be at peace already. They're no longer frightened and anxious because Jesus is here. You know, they're beginning to see that their greatest worries about life are no longer present because Jesus isn't in fact dead he is alive but Jesus says this to them a second time anyways peace be with you what's so special about it well Jesus presence as a resurrected Lord was not just for their earthly anxiety they certainly had plenty of that so do we what are you anxious about the disciples were worried about being criminalized and killed I certainly hope most of you are not having that anxiety. But we have lots of anxiety. Maybe you're worried about a test coming up in school or a job interview or just the unknowns of the future when it comes to deciding which college you want to attend and what career path to follow. Or maybe you're worried you might lose your job and your family situation isn't quite as financially secure as you would like. We all have anxieties and worries. And sometimes the presence of our resurrected Lord does assuage those very earthly anxieties. But that's not the main purpose of it. In fact, there are other places in the scriptures where he promises that we are going to have those things. 
And not only that, we're going to have them precisely because we believe in him and follow him. Now, Jesus' peace being offered here is much greater and deeper than that. The very reality of his resurrection addresses a certain kind of peace that we often spend most of our lives distracting ourselves from. In our men's Bible study on Saturday, we talked a lot about dealing with death. And death is one of those moments where this yawning anxiety about the ultimate nature of life, your existence, and the purpose of you being here is brought to bear in front of you in a way that's often hard to ignore. But most of our lives, we can ignore those questions. We get distracted. We can entertain ourselves. I don't really have to think about what is the purpose of me being here. Why am I alive and what's going to happen after I die? But it is there. And don't be fooled, people are, most of the driving forces of the reasons people believe the things they believe and do the things they do are generated by those questions. And those who have no answer to them are deeply anxious on an existential level. That's a fancy word that just means like they're, ver- they're worried about their very being, their very existence. What is the reason that they are here? And maybe you have asked yourselves, such questions from time to time. The peace being offered to the disciples here and the peace being offered to you in Jesus' words, peace be with you, addresses that ultimate disquiet. The yawning abyss those questions can bring in front of you when you don't have an answer to those things, when you struggle to find meaning in your life. That is where the disciples were, even if they didn't fully realize it at the beginning of our text. Their meaning and purpose was all wrapped up in the person of Jesus, who they think is now dead. So they're not just worried about being branded as criminals, but their whole purpose for life has been shattered. If you've ever been there, that's a really terrible place to be. Well, no longer... No longer do you have to wrestle with answers to those questions. No longer do the disciples have to wrestle with answers to those questions because the full truth is just beginning to be revealed. In Jesus' words to his disciples, peace be with you. Paul highlights this reality. He says, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you may know this text, We are the people in all of existence most to be pitied. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, all of those hopes and faiths and dreams about the future that he proclaimed would not be real. So when Jesus shows up, the victorious and resurrected Lord who bears the wounds of the death born on the cross for the salvation of the world, for the forgiveness of your sins, and says, peace be with you. He's declaring a reality that is just disconnected from your feelings. A reality that can be at at present in your life when you at least expect it. Many of us have had really terrible times in our earthly life. Maybe the loss of a very dear loved one, the death of a child. Being with people in those moments and you would say that peace is the last thing present there except this new peace that Jesus declares to you and I and to his disciples is always present there because it's not a mere feeling of calm and tranquility and contentment, but the declaration of a new reality which we now have in Jesus because he rose from the dead. Peace be with you, he says to his disciples, because now they have present comfort in a certain future hope. The Messiah is alive. Jesus, because of God's plan of salvation, has accomplished and defeated the great enemy that haunts those questions about life, purpose, and meaning. How great is it to have clear answers to those questions? What is the meaning of your life? Why are you here? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. What is the purpose of your life? To glorify God 
and strive by the grace of the Holy Spirit, which we read he graciously gives out in our text today to his disciples, to live lives obedient to his will. And what is the purpose of your life? To tell others about this new reality of peace. Our world so desperately needs answers to those questions. As human beings, even those who don't believe in Jesus, those questions are like a mandate that we have to answer. People are asking them. They're living their lives in search of them. And what Jesus is declaring to his disciples and to us today is all of those answers are found in him. No longer must you have anxiety over those big questions about life, existence, and purpose. They are found answered in me. Peace be with you. But he doesn't stop there. right? Then he says that I'm bringing this peace to you. I'm declaring, I'm proclaiming the reality of the resurrection to you, not so that you can go home and just be joyful in your own living room. But I'm going to send you. Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you, he says. What is he sending you with? Is he sending you with great powers of reason and deduction and wise sayings and the exemplary life? No, he's not sending you with any of those things. What he's sending you with, sending with you, is the very thing he's bringing in this text. The peace that comes from faith in the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus validates all the aspects of our faith, answers all the great questions of life that plague our minds because Christ is risen, victorious over death. So he says to his disciples and he says to you, I am sending you. He isn't sending you alone. Don't worry. He breathes on the disciples and By extension of this verse, we understand it as being breathed on the church of God. Receive the Holy Spirit. And he grants us the ability to forgive sins. And that was something that was carried out through the office of the pastor in Christ's church just moments ago for each and every one of us. That in the stead and by the command of Christ, this is the command instead of Christ right here. Your sins are declared forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, peace be with you. When you say these words to your fellow Christians, I want you to keep this in mind that you're not merely wishing for a reprieve from stress or a day of tranquility or even harmony in a relationship. What you are declaring to them is the reality that you share, that because Jesus is risen from the dead, You have a deep and abiding peace in the certain future hope that he has secured for each and every one of us. You are speaking of their meaning, their purpose, and their future. You are helping provide an answer for those deep and abiding and unsettling questions. So I thought it would be great to end this sermon. We started this up again last week is one of the things that's common in the church, and COVID kind of squashed this for a little while, but we're bringing it back, is sharing the greeting of peace with one another. And this is where that tradition finds its roots, this declaration of peace from God. So now, from now on, when you're doing that, know that you are wishing this resurrection peace for your brothers and sisters in Christ, not some mere feeling, not some mere reprieve from earthly stress, but the declared reality of your peace and my peace in the risen and victorious Jesus. So at this time, please stand up. Stay in your pews, but turn to those around you and share the peace of Christ with them. Peace of the Lord with you, Mark. May the peace